March 2020. We are ordered to stay at home. It's the end of the world. Hence, we've decided to make a video about the beginning of it all. Today, we're going to talk about scientific advances, quarrels, bombs, cons, dogmatic spirit. In three words, we're going to talk about the history of prehistory. Let's go. First, we'll give a pre-19th century context. 17th century, James Usher, Irish bishop, historian, released a biblical chronology situating creation on the eve of March 23rd, 4004. Precise. 17th century still, Nicolas Steno, Danish bishop, is rather interested in geology and anatomy. He'll be the first to put into light the principle of superposition and geological stratigraphy. Geology will create the tools to prove that the Earth wasn't created in six days, but rather in billions of years. Therefore, it cannot only be five or six thousand years old. In the beginning of the 19th century, in spite of the existence of science academies and numerous brilliant figures, the official truth stays defiantly hung to the catastrophist idea of the Flood. Hence, it is admitted to find fossils of pre-Flood periods, but only animals. And even though there's a real thirst from both the scientific community and the public to prove this wrong, little to none have been found so far. For example, in the 18th century, a naturalist found a very big human-looking fossil on a block of slate. He named it Homo diluvii testis, man who was witness of the flood. But Cuvier, in the 19th century, proved that it was only a salamander. This story proves that there's a part of the scientific community that is definitely expecting to find human fossils, but it'll have to wait a little bit longer. Flash forward to Jacques Boucher de Crèvecoeur de Perthes. You cannot make this up. As a wealthy man whose father gave him the interest in science, he started financing a society of emulation and research in his own town in Abbeville. In 1844, during excavations behind the hospital of Abbeville, workers found flint tools together with bones of large extinct mammals. Boucher de Perth dated them from the Diluvium period, which nowadays would be a rather cold place to see. But he was right, he was on to something. Even though no human bones were found nearby, he was convinced that those rocks were man-made and that whoever made them was contemporary to the mammals. In 1849, he published his Celtic and Antediluvian Antiquities, exposing his theories about Antediluvian man and his lithic industry. And although he wasn't officially followed by the Academy of Science, he drew the attention of a lot of famous scientific colleagues, such as Isidore Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, Édouard Larté, Jean-Baptiste Noulet, and even Charles Lyell, the famous geologist. He then proceeded in further excavations to prove his theories. And to avoid critics about the authenticity of his findings, he had to be super strict in his method. Therefore, he was the first to apply the strict stratigraphy reading of the paleontologists to his own research. Until now, his technique hasn't been taught. In 1859, he finally got an official recognition with the creation of the Chair of Anthropology of Paris. 1856, Germany, Neander Valley, meaning Valley of the New Man. It was named like this since the 17th century, and it's very ironic because it delivered the discovery of a rather ancient man. Exploitation of a quarry 
and discovery of a series of human fossils. Skull fragments, arm, shoulder, femur. The problem is, they were not found in the proper archaeological context, therefore they were hard to date. So at the time, many different interpretations were given of these bones. A, that it was the remains of a former Russian soldier killed by the Napoleon army. B, that he was an ancient Celt. C, and that one came from the most eminent anthropologist of the time, Vershoff, quote, it's nothing but a contemporary man, sadly ordinary, probably deformed, no doubt Nimwit, <laughs> who died five or six hundred years ago from rickets, end quote. So, what we have so far is stratigraphy, old earth, animal fossils, man-made tools found with animal fossils, belief in the Delivium era, and a human fossil that wasn't found in the proper archaeological context and therefore was not expertised with enough scrutiny. The release of this book acted like a bomb in the 19th century society, and not just among the academics, but generally. The first, as well as the other retouched publications, were an absolute bestseller, and very quickly translated into several languages. With success comes jealousy, and the subject being very touchy at the time, only at the time, we can imagine the controversy. As is visible on these caricatures, Darwin's intellectual adversaries tend to criticize his insinuation that men descend from apes, which is a mistake because according to Darwin, men are apes. Evolution isn't a straight line, nor is it a tree, as Darwin had imagined it. And there's no notion of progress either, by the way. It's immensely more complicated than that, it's rather a bush with an incredible number of species sharing more or less characteristics, and men are just one among others. Imagine. First, we have to learn that it's the Earth that's revolving around the Sun. Then, our entire solar system is just one minor on the outskirts of the galaxy. Then, that there are countless galaxies. And now, we have to swallow that we are just one more insignificant animal species among others. That's a lot to take in. So, among the many backlash that Darwin had to endure ensuing his theory, one of his allies came to the rescue with this beautiful phrase. Quote, As for me, I'd rather be a sophisticated ape than a degenerated Adam. End quote. Just a little precision here. Even though the evolution uh, theory of Darwin came in the same period, it doesn't mean that it helped prehistory in any way. Prehistorians were only starting to establish that men were ancient, but they didn't say men evolved from another species or from various species. Actually, there was this theory of the fixism, stating that every species, whether they were animal or men, had been created and had always existed the same way. Some of them were extinct, some of them kept on living, but Darwin's theory will not forever change the prehistoric research. It will just be used several years later to add to it. In any case, in the light of this groundbreaking perspective, and of course, because the general view on life and history had been forever disrupted by all of these discoveries, it was time to reevaluate former findings that had been discarded before for lack of interest. First found during a building site in 1848, it was later re-examined in 1862. It turned out to be a woman whose skull had similar characteristics to that of Neanderthal. Although, like the latter, this discovery lacked archaeological context. Yet this time, instead of explaining these singularities by a deformity or a disease, a pattern starts to emerge. 
Neanderthal man could have been called Angus man. 1829, Belgium. Dr. Schmerling is conducting excavations in a series of caves. Driven by a passion for what will become paleontology, he's looking for fossils. And he will find mammoths and woolly rhinos bones. In his publications, he will also mention the presence of human fossils. Unfortunately, maybe it was too soon, maybe he didn't have enough rigor in his technique to prove his discovery. In any case, years later, these human fossils that were indeed as old as the animals surrounding them turned out to be Neanderthal type. In 1861, Edouard Larté will establish a chronology of the Paleolithic era with the age of the bear, the mammoth, the reindeer and the bull. The only thing missing now is the discovery of a human fossil in the archaeological context with its tools and ancient animal fossils. And it will happen one year later in Dordogne. So we've reached the end of this first part of the video and um, the point so far has been to show how much this incredible 19th century has completely shaken all the knowledge and all the thoughts that everybody had thanks to the creation of a lot of new sciences such as paleontology, geology, archaeology and now prehistory. Um, from that moment on, after 1863, it will become pretty much admitted that all of these things existed and because of that fa favorable context, a lot of people will start finding things and it's gonna take a huge step forward. Most of these new findings post-1863 will actually take place in our region in Dordogne. So that will be the subject of our next video. So stay tuned. If you like this video, thumbs up button and please subscribe. We know we don't have many subscribers so far, so feel free and um, see you next time. C'est bon? Okay. <laughs>